We're continuing our patrol missions and entering back into Federation territory with the Cassay Sector block, with our first stop being an away mission down to a planet in the system. Cernan 2 is inhabited and has trace amounts of argon and nitrogen in its atmosphere, which means away teams need to be prepared with triox compounds to pre-oxygenate the blood for some time. There's also a health warning to benzites, who are advised to wear breathing apparatuses, even those who do without. Fortunately, our business takes place on Cernan 5. Upon scanning the system, we detect some ship wreckage on the fifth planet, so we set a course for transporter range. The planet is surrounded by twisting clouds of dust, rocky debris, and a strange mineral formation that resembles torn cloth at a distance. Probably a ring of extra thick interstellar dust. We beam down to the planet. Apparently this atmosphere is also tolerable for us as we don't need breathing gear or protective clothing. From this range we can pick up the debris. Smet marks it as being as most likely a class 5 commercial vessel, making it a freighter or cargo ship of some description. Cernan 5 is a rather arid world with twisting spires of red streaked rock jutting from dried mud surfaces with the occasional cluster of flora in the forms of these twisted trees. Amid the shade of these occasional clusters are fungal growths of considerable size and a scattering of creeping plants consisting of thick bracken-like growths. Over it all carried on the dry breeze are particles of ash or dust filtering down from the pale sky. Ahead we see glinting metal on a slight rise. It's a piece of the debris we've been detecting since we entered the system. Tomet says she's located a piece of the debris, thank you for stealing the credit there. But she says it matches a benzite transport ship, the Ranek. The ship was reported missing three years ago. It was assumed to have been attacked by raiders. It looks like it may have been and then crashed on this planet. I am reminded of the warnings we saw when we entered the system, that benzites needed to take special care in this atmosphere, even if others can find it tolerable when bolstered by triox. Although the warnings were for Cernan 2 and we're currently on Cernan 5, I think this most likely to be probably just an overlooked typo, and this is supposed to be the same planet. And at the end of the day I don't see any benzite survivors. From the five pieces of debris that we do manage to find scattered all over this valley, Tibet manages to piece together the blast marks and concludes that they're from Orion vessels. If the Rannoch was downed by Orion vessels, it was most likely the Syndicate. We record the loss, the location and mark it for future salvage. With that done, we beam back to the ship and carry on with our patrols. The Ayala system houses the Federation Penal Colony 4028, a secret prison. We have no business here, so we're not allowed to enter the system at this time. The Briar Patch skirts into this sector block, but we've already explored it, so passing on through we arrive at the Parvo system, a completely unremarkable one, with nothing going on, nothing ever bad ever happened there. I of course joke. Parvo is a sentient planet, in a way. It has a very interconnected network of telepathic life forms, from the native sentient species to the plant life itself. It's bolstered and supported by crystalline structures that act as antennae with even subspace properties. And while benign, the planet's collective mind has been coerced before into acting out. So it's a protected world, and the Federation maintains a Vulcan science team here 24-7. Since our interactions here, it has been mercifully quiet, so we move on. The Serban system is up next with its not quite twin planets 1 and 2. They're not identical, but they share some similarities with Romulus and Remus. Starfleet has marked the system as one of interest for studying Hobus, while the Klingons have put out a travel advisory concerning Orion pirates. There used to be a patrol mission where we could deal with these pirates, but not anymore. So moving on. We pass by a system that gives this sector its namesake, Kase, which is a G-class star. The system has high levels of neutron isotopes that interfere with communications, and the Federation science team has been studying an extinct reptilian species here that may be linked to the Gorm. We covered this patrol mission all that time ago in episode 11 of the Star Trek Online story series. Sarda is up next, which is a Federation colony world and a flourishing one at that, with 4.7 million inhabitants. It even hosts the famous Sarda Academy of Cosmology, as well as several tourist spots. There are volcanic lakes in the Olpec province, and visitors can see the Great Plumes, an aurora-like effect, 
not to be confused with the Great Plumes of Argosoria, a completely different cosmological event. The planet is having trouble with Norsican raiders, who are usurping legitimate salvage operations in the rings of the system, with force. We are here to drive them off, with force. Norsican ships like to employ siphon drones in an attempt to drain our power reserves. It's annoying, but not too much of a threat. I'm more curious to know what the wreckage is that these salvage operations are after. They're in orbit of the planet, which is now a flourishing colony world, so I'm wondering are they some sort of leftover stationary satellites that used to house the inhabitants, and now that they're no longer needed because the colony is in such a flourishing state. Either way, the five wrecked, whatever they are, in orbit are spoken for. They're not for Norsicans, so I'm afraid we had to dispatch them. Quite simply, when the area is secured and the Norsicans have either been destroyed or driven off, our mission is complete and we're free to leave the system. Next up is the Ducky system, or Daisy, or Dace. Ducky Daisy Dace. Either way, it is a lovely Class Y planet. So, unless you're some sort of mimetic silver compound, you're not really going to live here. Or Atholian. The travel warnings for this system include a message to not enter low orbit of the planet as thermonic radiation can be discharged and is considered a hazard. The planet, despite its conditions, is heavily populated, mostly by researchers. We can see the lights of many a settlement from orbit. They must be domed cities, or at least behind some sort of force fields. In a similar fashion to the Casse sector, they have actually found early reptilian signs of life on this planet, which, like Kase, has drawn the Gorn to investigate. Unfortunately, they're not being cooperative, and the archaeological team has requested our assistance so that they can then call in further Federation Science Council members and exopaleontologists. As before, we're to drive out the Gorn aggressors. And I can't help but think what a shame this is, because the Gorn to talk to us, at least in the 25th century, and some of these vessels are labelled as science ships. So I feel like a bit of an asshole here. Especially if we are researching what turns out to be some sort of ancestral progenitor race of the Gorn, because then surely they have a right to study this too. It's a shame they're just doing so with violence. I guess I should just look at it this way. We wouldn't be here exchanging energy fire with the Gorn ships if diplomacy had worked. With that messy business behind us, we make for the next sector block, the Sellers sector, and oh my, is there a lot to do. First up is the Zenic system, founded in 2402, and now holds a colony of 22,000 residents. Their orbital sensor system has detected strange and large creatures in orbit of the planet, which would mark them as cosmozoans, species that can survive in space. Understandably, the colonists are a little wary, as they want to know what exactly they're dealing with. We've not come here to be all guns blazing, like last time, fortunately. We're just here to investigate. As we close in, our science officer says she cannot locate any sign of these creatures. However, Scans of the planet have revealed strange cocoons on the southern hemisphere, something that we should probably investigate considering our experiences with things like, you know, say, the Herc recently. We beam down to find another arid but habitable environment to stand in. It's slightly warm, and instead of dried mud this time we have sand, although there are still rocky formations many of which are now arches, presumably created by wind erosion. After a brief hike across the terrain, we spot one of the cocoons that we're here to investigate. They're smaller than I expected. We can see it pulsating and undulating with something within. Clearly, it's alive, but is it dangerous? Now, Kitma Alliance Liaison, hence in the vow, states they are six hours old, and from the Pycan Space Moth, a type of creature that lives in space. She also goes on to say that some are indeed dangerous, but not all types of this moth are. She can't quite tell what type of moth this one is, so perhaps investigating other pods will yield answers. 
After locating a further four cocoons, she's able to identify it as the Pike and Flame Moth, and despite the name, it's actually rather harmless. And in fact, she says the colonists might even be able to gather to watch the emergence, as it can be quite a spectacular affair to witness them hatch and then spend a couple of hours on the surface before flying into space. Next up is the Mandel system. Here are several locations, one of which is redacted as the site of the secret Federation prison facility 2047. It's marked as redacted on the map. However, Mandel Prime is a supergiant and only six parsecs from a regular trade route. Starfleet assigns regular patrols through this system, we being one of them, to deter pirate activity. It's all about securing the system and those trade routes, it's got nothing to do with the secret facility further out in the system. As we enter, however, we receive our orders from Captain Sulu, who manages the patrols, and explains that there are minerals in this system that are natural dampeners to sensors, which has allowed the Orion Syndicate to hole up here to ambush ships, which in turn has led to civilian traffic avoiding the system. We are to engage the pirate forces to drive them out. The Orion pirates are no match for the Armager, and when we're done, we're free to leave and continue with our patrols. We pass by Pryor's World, a system which featured the loss of the USS Baran in 2256 and the switchover between Mirror Lorca and the Prime Universe counterpart. Since that fateful mission, which saw a young Lieutenant Hale marooned on Pryor's 5D for days, the system has resumed its growth, and has a population of 17.2 million. We pass by the Delphic region, and if this name sounds familiar, it's because this was the locale for the Delphic Expanse, which was neutralised in 2154. Said expanse was home to the incursions from the Sphere Builders or Guardians, the displaced species accidentally removed from time by our own machinations during the Iconian War build-up, resulting in a new faction for the Temporal Cold War. The expanse was being shifted into a region where space-time warping anomalies were common, all in an effort to make the realm habitable for the interlopers. It was becoming increasingly uninhabitable, with the area expanding and threatening the entire Federation, reaching as far as Andoria by the 26th century. You wouldn't know it to look at it now, as the area has been returned to regular space-time. Next up is the Watran system, home to… well, no one, it's uninhabited. Despite the presence of an L-class world, one suitable for terraforming or aided colonisation, the tidal forces on the planet of Watchrun 3 are too much to settle, and the mainlands further in are mostly arid desert. There are easier options to colonise, basically. However, there is a Federation mining operation in this system, except now it's in ruins from some unknown attacker. Federation long-range sensors have marked the Gorn as currently here, but they turned up after the destruction, so it's suspected that they're not responsible. That being said, the Gorn are still being annoying and preventing us from scanning our own bases to discern what happened. Basically, we do not need to engage the Gorn in battle. We just need the sensor logs and readings from our destroyed installations to work out who did this. But you try telling the Gorn that because they're being all territorial and like, no, this is our wreckage. Get away, pew pew. We are free, however, to basically just scan our five installations and then run while the Gorn continue to fire at our retreating tails. I don't care, I'm not fighting you today, I've had enough of that. But we have collected enough information. It does look like the Norsicans are the ones that attacked. The Gorn moved in afterwards to make the most of the opportunity. We then pass by the Corvan system, a major Federation dilithium supplier located on Corvan 2. This place was attacked during the Federation Klingon Wars of the 23rd century. Fortunately, at the moment, there's nothing notable going on in the system, so we carry on. The HANA system is a little more problematic. It has a trinary planet formation, where three planets share an orbital path and are sort of tidally locked. Twin planets are unusual, but encountered often. Vulcan and Tukut, Romulus and Remus. Three, however? Well, that's stranger still. On top of this, it was a binary star system. Unfortunately, both of these things have been ruined, when in 2166, one of the stars exploded and took out one of these planets. So I guess it's now two and a half planets. 
sharing an orbit. Long story short, we enter the system and are told to wait for the arrival of the Akira-class USS Mirac and uh, Captain Jason Leonard. We had a mining outpost in the system too, however it had been taken over by someone else, in this case a Klingon house. The specific one is not mentioned. But although there are only a couple of Klingon ships, they've had time to set up defences, including automated disruptor turrets, patrols and encampments on the actual mining station itself. We're here to destroy them, basically. We start with their outer defences, which are the stationary disruptor turret emplacements. Then we engage the patrolling forces, destroying those before moving on to the station itself. We kind of have to be a little careful when fighting the station. It is, of course, our own installation, so it wouldn't do to just blow it all up. The Marek is actually going to beam a strike team aboard the station to root the Klingons that are there out. We just have to provide cover, which we can do by jamming the Klingons' communications, preventing them from summoning reinforcements. When we're done, we give a cursory sweep past the installation to make sure everything's okay, and I can't help but thinking, the Federation now have a lot of assets, especially mines, but unless you're a massive colony like Corban, it seems they're quite easy pickings for a lot of other powers. We receive word from Captain Leonard, who's not in uniform by the way, he's only wearing one pimp, that his strike team has secured the station. Next up, we look at the Maro system, which has some unusual anti-chroniton particles that lead people to suspect it was the site of some temporal event, or will be. These anti-chronotons are mentioned to us in the brief by Captain Sulu, who goes on to state that they call them Crusher particles in honour of Wesley Crusher. He he doesn't he doesn't elaborate or call um why though. Anyway, this is the reason for all the satellites and collectors. However, we're here to conduct maintenance on them as they've begun to degrade. Turns out, though, that that is down to the meddling of some Orion Syndicate forces who are attempting to pilfer our collective particles. This was an incredibly easy mission, like stupidly easy. It appears the level sinking for this mission is not active, meaning that all of the ships were 47 levels lower than me. They, they died in one shot. When we've deterred the Orions by accidentally blowing them all up and repaired the satellites, Sulu goes on to explain just why this was necessary. Anti-time distortions leave behind traces of anti-chroniton particles, such as the one encountered in 2370 by the Enterprise D. Basically, Starfleet still doesn't know too much about them and wants to play it safe, because an anti-time distortion like that happening again is kind of a big deal, and something they want to avoid. After stopping to briefly survey another comet, we scoot past the Eldrin system and arrive at the Vela system, which too originally had a patrol mission where you fend off Orion pirates. This system is one that has seen a crackdown from both the Klingons and Federation but since they went to war in 2405 because of its tactical position. Sucks to be the Orion Syndicate then, because they originally had a hold over this place, not anymore. There's also the Regulus system, which is a major inhabited Federation world focused on trade. Starfleet Intelligence has had a base there at one time, and the Orions even owned it for a while, and there was even a Romulan colony there in the early 23rd century. But the last area we will look at is the Arucanis Arm, which is a long curve of systems, however few are settled, as they're mostly nebula, protostars, and other luminous gases. There is, of course, the Sellers system itself, which I have explored, but that will be for the next part as it has a longer multi-part mission to take care of. So until then, that is another two sectors down, both of which are crammed full of patrol missions. Not all the sectors are like this, as so some of them have barely anything going on. So we'll pick up there next week. Until then, I've been Rick. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.